Hi there, I'm Mike Gamble from Epic Games and we're here at the Make Something Unreal Live competition at the Gadget Show Live. This is the culmination of a competition run by ourselves, Epic and Train to Game, over six months where teams of 10 students create games based on the fighting fantasy IP. We're here, we have six days left to go before they present to Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson to choose the winner and the winners receive an iOS license from Epic Games. In terms of graphics that these guys are seeing to that bag we just saw then, are these things that you guys you guys are modelling? Yeah, 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 we're doing all sorts. Um, I think our biggest front this today was definitely the pickups. It's a nice sense of a progression and so on and so forth, which is awesome. I just, and we've also made the Orcs a bit brighter because that made them a bit more, a bit like a Hulk, but it looked a lot more fun. We're still working, oh, there's a bit of a bug there with the icon not aligning, but we're addressing it. I think what really stands out to me here, I mean, I'm from a graphics background, is that the art is absolutely fantastic. I know we were sitting over the back there, and I think if you get a chance, go and, go and uh, have a look in there, little team area. You've got this one world that you haven't shown here. Oh. It was just absolutely fantastic. It really made your heart beat. It, just, it looked wonderful. I'll be honest with you, we're holding back on a lot of stuff to show you later. Um, we want to be teasing you guys right now, and don't worry, there's a lot more to come. A lot. Such a teaser. Especially in iOS, uh, when you're tapping on a screen, you can never unfortunately assume with an iPad or with an iPhone that you have audio. Because, you know, whenever I take my iPad, you know, anywhere, I almost never bring the headset. And so if I'm, gonna, I'm not going to like plug it in and do the super immersive gaming experience. I'm going to fire the game up and maybe have a little bit of audio in the airplane or whatever. And then I have to rely on really, really obvious graphical feedback. So that's really cool that you do that. It sounds like you put some work also into combat. I wouldn't forget navigation. Yeah. As far as how you can make the world easier to navigate. Um, you guys, if I recall, were one of the few that had kind of the tap and go controls which I love, I'm a big fan of, but I also would love to be able to just kind of swipe around and kind of look around the world, around my character. Uh, you can get some really great exploration there, whereas you have kind of a plain splined path of players going up the mountain, but if you stop and turn around and look behind your guy, you might be able to see little treasures that are nestled away. So yeah. I know uh, combat's a big focus for you, but you know, in a game like this, you're definitely gonna to want to have some exploration. Nice presentation, quite a technical presentation. Um, I'm interested uh, to hear more about your design uh, sort of concept in terms of how you, close you are going to stick to the books and in terms of how the sort of decision making process happens through the gameplay. Well, um, we are we're sticking fairly close to the core of the book. Um, our story is actually set eight months after. The, you are actually the brother of the first hero, and you go in and basically follow in his footsteps looking for the Warlock's treasure. Uh, as it comes for decision making, you can choose whether or not to go into the various rooms, just like in the book, except now it's for real. Um, obviously, various dangers await you in the different rooms. Each one's different, containing different puzzles, challenges, and so on and so forth. And uh, every room you go into will have consequences. Some you'll have to go into to find the correct keys, as per the book. Others will simply be an onslaught of orcs. At the moment, these are, these are the icons which are for attacks, right? That's correct. And sometimes... Oh, he attacked you. Okay, yeah. And sometimes these are in the process of warming up, yeah? Yes, that's right. So currently, I think there's an issue with the way these are presented. There's a lot of presentation issues. A lot of how the game's working is fundamentally good. But the way you're presenting things could be clearer to the player. These are kind of floating icons. This, as far as I can work out, is just to open and close the book of stuff, yeah? That's correct. Yet it looks exactly the same as if it's one of these. This is not separated. These are not labelled. Also, graphically, they're just existing in the world along with every other object. They're not separated as a HUD, there's no shadow, there's no little box they're living in, and there's no differentiation between which ones I can press now and which I can't. Just looking at these views, one of the things you're doing is you're building some very long corridors, right? You're making life difficult for yourself when you're doing this, because it's very hard to fill those up with enough stuff to make them interesting, but they're yeah. also simultaneously taking away the, the idea of exploration and mystery from the player. So the player kind of see what's coming, you know? It's miles away, they've got to walk there before they can do anything. So the player wants to explore. It's a real human thing to just explore somewhere you don't know, 
you get suspense, you get all kinds of emotions out of exploring places where you're not quite sure what's around the corner. Yeah. So you're simultaneously making it hard for yourself to make the game look good, and you're actually detracting from the player's fun of exploring somewhere. You can see, you know, it's, it's crazy. We're making a game. I was presented in front of, you know, Steve, uh, Steve Jackson and Sam Mills from Whale Trail and things like that, some really big names. and. Whoa, and I, oh, oh, yesterday I also presented in front of Cliff Brzezinski, and that was just like, whoa, step back, this is this has just got big. So we're going really well so far. But working together as a team in one area, we've got so much done. We've taken on uh, constructive criticism from the judges, you know, Pia Molyneux, Cliffy B. We've had John Hare, Joe Twist, um, uh, Neil Palmer, uh, Mills, the list could go on. It's had such great feedback. Right, now, to start off with, uh, just to reinforce what John said, whilst I love your ambition that you said at the start, uh, John was actually right, most of your talk was talking about that ambition. There's one golden rule when you're actually, you know, presenting, don't talk about something when you can show it. So <laughs> it'd be far better to, and I don't know your colleague's name, to get him to wander around the dungeons and say, right, here's we want to tell you a bit of story. How are we going to do that? Rather than go through those explanations. And then you can get the people excited about the story and excited about the game. Remember, when you're making any game, the one thing that a publisher, or a developer, or you know, I always ask you the same question. Who's your audience? Who are you writing this for? Now, an idiot like me always says, well, it's everyone in the world, because it's going to sell, you know, six billion copies. But a sensible person like you should say, and this is what next, on Sunday is going to be, you're going to present it to Ian and Steve. You say, I'm writing it for the people who loved your books. So when you're walking through the dungeon and say, I think you should say, look, there's that creep, that, that monster, the first monster, the goblin you met on page 56. And this is the, this is the, the a puzzle that we, we, uh, we've been inspired by, not exactly the same as books didn't work in a game. That's gonna be really impressive to them because they can see you, you want to convince them that you love their books as much as they loved making them. Now, things I love, um, this uh, way of navigating around I think is brilliant. I think a lot of people really struggle with thumbsticks. I would really start to think about other ways of perhaps exploiting this. You know, are there, are there little puzzles you, you can give people a little bit more choices in there? as you go through the book, but I think you've got something which I could sit back and play and I don't need to worry about. As John says, I think the combat screens need a fair amount of work. Well, I don't know what to say, Johnny, because um, this is a really tough ask that they've been asked to do, a game in a short amount of time. And they've been here all week polishing, and tomorrow they're going to present to the two authors of Fighting Fantasy, 15 million books, some pretty heavy weights in the industry. And I, I'm gobsmacked, right? And the, the reason is because there's been so many changes that we've suggested, and I have no idea how on earth you've done them in the time, because I think you've worked brilliantly, the lot of you, because it's really hard. I was, I was sitting down there thinking what to, to write, and you, you've put in this stuff that, you know, the, these shields were right in the middle of the screen. They were obtrusive. It looked like the game was paused. They've been changed. They're better. The cooldown is something that we suggested this week, if I remember rightly, the way that it's done, you know. All of that's been brought in. So it, it's, it's an immense effort that you've done over this week. So I think you've done really well. Again, it was a fantastic presentation. Well Thank done. You. Um, as I said this morning, I think um, that the way you've uh, incorporated such touch controls into where you move is very intuitive. It's very sort of easy to move around. Um, a combat I'm a big fan of. Uh, again, Thank you. As I said this morning, I'm a big fan of fantasy fan, and having that sort of turn-based combat isn't necessarily um, as prevalent today as it was, say, like 10 years ago. So having that in this sort of game is great. 
And the fact that you, between attacks, can do something. The fact that you can defend keeps you busy. Um, I will sort of make the comment so that maybe having it a little bit quicker, maybe some of the attacks, just okay. a bit, bit more sort of nippier. That'd be good. But apart from that, the combat does look fantastic. Thank you um, very much. And it's good that you just picked up on comments this morning about Twitter and all that. So it's great yeah. to see We've, you put yeah, yeah. Twitter, Facebook links on there. You've got the guys at the back um, sort of helping out throwing out um, sort of t-shirts and whatnot. Um, but don't rest on your laurels with that sort of stuff. As you're leading up to release, keep promoting your game, post pictures, do competitions. Thank you. After it's released, keep doing that sort of stuff because that's really important to sort of put it out there. Because I think a lot, of, a lot of iPhone developers, a lot of developers in general, just release a game, release a press release, and then forget about it. They don't think actually we need to engage with our audience. So that's really important. Yeah. Events left and there's events right, but our true focus is to make our game and make it epic as the title suggests. I personally fear, I'm fearing Digital Major at the moment right now. Their game is looking pretty good. Uh, you know, it's not, I don't think it's as pretty as our game, but for what the iOS, for what the iOS market is, a nice casual experience, they definitely achieved that. But I think with our game, we're hitting a new audience, or not a new audience, an already established audience, the Infinity Blade audience. We put on delivering to them, making them want our game. And Infinity Blade made two million in sales in 11 days. We're gonna make the same, or at least hopefully. I just wanna point out as well, we have 11 rooms in this game. We've tried to hold it so close to the book, which has been incredibly hard because you know, like, whoa, we wanna put this in, we wanna put that in. We're big fans of the book itself, so it's really kinda of hard to narrow down what we can't put in judging on the time we've had. Guiding the player where they need to go, that is so important. They really know where they need to go. If otherwise, the player will think, I'm not gonna play this game, I don't know where I'm going. So yeah, teleports you around and says, there you go, that's where you need to go now, you've got that key. And after this competition, are you going to keep together as a team and and perhaps uh, yeah, def go on and do more games? Well, definitely would love to do that. It's a real passion ours. We really want to win this competition. We put our heart and soul and passion into this. And as I said, you are, if anything, you've been our gods in the industry. We bow to you and we're like, I've got a secret temple in my room where I'm like this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but overall, you know, we would do our very best. The winner today is Commando Kiwi. Step forward. Well done, everybody else. And do not lose heart. Ultimately, you could be the winning game. But today, Commando Kiwi was the winner. It was a really hard decision because the, uh, the four groups uh, who had already passed through several barriers and uh, mini competitions on the way here, uh, they were all very talented and uh, the standard of games that came out were unbelievable. I mean, it would have been very easy to pick four winners out of the four of them. Hurry!